All right. Hello, Ryan. What's up? How you doing? Doing great. It's great to be with you again. Good to drive with you. We're in your Model 3. I know you love this car a lot. It's kind of a game-changing car. So is the Tesla Model Y. However, not everything by Tesla is perfect, Ryan, right? Yeah. We spent last week talking about a bunch of things that Tesla does great, but you know, this is a car. There's things that are wrong with it. There's things wrong with Tesla, and I think it's important to focus on those parts as well. Absolutely agree. So in this video, we're going to talk about the things Tesla can improve on and maybe also give some suggestions of alternatives. Granted, I don't think Tesla has viable competitors wholesale in every uh, category we're going to talk about, but we'll hopefully talk about, like, in each of these complaints, other cars that offer um, better things than Tesla in these departments. So let's get into it uh, and talk about our NIGs with um, the current crop of Tesla vehicles. All right, Ryan. So first up, it seems that like I think the big thing is everyone's so impressed with Tesla's range numbers. And real world, we actually see they get good range. However, it's a little bit misleading because if you look at the EPA ranges on their site, they're not actually accurate. Absolutely. That's something we've definitely noticed. Here at Out of Spec, we run our 70 mile per hour, oh boy. Kia Soul just sending it. <laughs> yeah. uh, we run 70 mile per hour range tests where we take EVs, run them at 70 miles per hour uh, on a set course and see how far they go from full to empty. And we have consistently seen great range numbers from Tesla. However, they're a lot lower than what they're claiming sometimes 20, 30% lower than what they're saying. And that's a unique issue to Tesla because like Porsche, you know, everyone kind of ragged on the Taycan when it came out because it's like, oh, this car's so inefficient. And then we act, people actually drove it and realized, hey, okay, it's not the most efficient car in the world, but it gets a heck of a lot more range than its EPA number. And without getting into too many details, I understand it's basically because manufacturers can actually determine which EPA cycle they use the test because the EPA test is real world conditions, it's not like Tesla's inventing the numbers, but they're choosing very advantageous cycles, whereas it seems like other manufacturers generally give, I think, a more realistic picture, even with their EPA figures. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not unique to tes Tesla. Other manufacturers do have errors in theirs. Some are accurate, some are inaccurate, as you've mentioned, yep. but it's absolutely something that you should be aware of. Yep. I would sorry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, this, this is rated for 272 mo miles. There's no way I'm going to get that far on the highway. What's your real world highway range in this? I'd imagine between 200 and 220. We're going to be doing a full range test soon, so we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Yeah, so still decent, right? It's not like they need to lie or fib, but they kind of do. Same thing with 0 to 60 on like the plaid. To get it under two seconds, they said one foot rollout. And almost no one else in the car industry uh, says 0 to 60 numbers that way. Now, I think I've noticed a lot of manufacturers have started doing that because Tesla introduced that. But basically... It's not that Tesla cars are bad, it's just that like, I don't know if this is the Elon influence or what, or the marketing, but they just have a tendency to kind of state the best case scenario, whereas other car makers, while not always 100% accurate, I find tend to be more just truthful in their figures. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, like you mentioned, with that zero to 60 time for the Plaid, they include the rollout, but even on the Model S long range non-Plaid, they don't include rollout. So it's so inconsistent it's even across inconsistent. Tesla. Yeah. And, and you know, you might say, what's the big deal? Well, if you're a buyer and you're cross shopping and you want a fast sedan, then you might think that the, you know, a Taycan or an EQS 580 AMG or whatever is way slower than a Model S Plaid. And they probably are, but they're not as much slower as you would think uh, if you were led to believe just from Tesla's numbers. Absolutely, which I think brings us to a really important point just about the clarity of the information from Tesla. For example, they just change the prices all the time. This year, I think they've chased, changed prices for the Model 3, what, five, six, seven different times? Model 3 and Model Y, they've also adjusted Model S and X prices, dropped them a bit. Generally, the trend in the last few months, which has been exciting, has been a drop in prices. And we don't want to get too much in the business or analytical end of things, but it seems like Tesla is facing some demand issues, has some inventory issues, and so this is a measure they're taking to avoid that. That's fine. Everyone adjusts prices in the car industry. The issue with Tesla is that if you're a Tesla owner, Ryan, like I know when you bought this car, a few weeks later, I think the price dropped another two grand or something. Yeah, I, I made the order. The price dropped actually $1,000 uh, between when I ordered it and when I took delivery. Fortunately, I only paid the price uh, at, when I took delivery, so I did get that discount. Oh, nice. It, it's just a little bit frustrating because yep. you know I, I'm budgeted for this number, and then all of a sudden it's changing. Yeah. Fortunately, in this case, it worked in my favor, but 
there's definitely times when they've increased prices as well. Yeah, and I have to be honest that overall, I'd rather take that model where at least I can see the final price upon delivery versus the dealer model where it's just gonna be such a strain and haggle to get to a final price. At least of Tesla, you know, it may change with the wins and whatever, but once you lock in your order, you know that price. Yeah. Uh, and there's no, you know, wiggle room. I don't know, when you, you trade it in your bolt, right? Yes. Was there any negotiations on that end of things? Nope. Just just submitted some pictures and they gave me a number. Yeah, fairly easy. So, you know, price changes, just, I think the big, bigger issue is they change the price all the time and that's annoying, especially, you know, if you get screwed over in value, but also uh, features. They just removed ultrasonic cameras and I think like told nobody. And the great thing is the Tesla community, I mean, a lot of you guys watching may be part of this, you obsessively document things on Twitter, on forums, you are always, tearing the stuff apart but it's not your job to do that i think tesla as a company could you know hire one person to like communicate changes to the cars as they make them i think it's cool that they don't you know wait for model years to make changes they're always kind of doing them um in process which is cool you know it, it lets them develop and iterate their cars faster i just wish they did a better job communicating that absolutely yeah totally agree yeah uh, the other thing is um, not entirely Tesla's fault, but just the fact of the matter is so many people have Model 3s and Ys. And Ryan, I have to be honest, I like your blue Model 3 color. I think it's like the best of very few options you had. Um, but it's just like, how do you customize a Model 3 or Y? I think it'd be nice if Tesla gave more factory paint colors, if they gave more customization of volume vehicles, like the Kia Niro EV and uh, its sister car, the um, Hyundai, sorry, the yeah, Hyundai Kona. They come in fun colors. Uh, and, you know, higher up competition, like the BMW i4, the Polestar 2 for cars like Model 3, I think those come in beautiful colors and trims. And I'm not saying that, like, you know, whether or not you think the Model 3 and Y are pretty cars is subjective. Uh, even if you think they're pretty, wouldn't it be nice to be able to customize them a bit more? Absolutely. There are literally five colors available for both the 3 and Y. And three of those colors are white, black, and gray. So. You really don't have much choice. There's not really anything too interesting that they offer, which I think is a bummer. It's a really popular vehicle. It's the most popular EV on the road. Yeah. And we're stuck with just a few different options. Yeah, and I think it's only gonna become worse and worse as like more Uber drivers, more people get these cars. That's a great thing for Tesla. That's a great thing, I think, just for the world. Uh, but it's kind of hard to stand out. You can, of course, vinyl wrap your Tesla. You know, uh, people do things like that. You could get a set of Martian wheels. We love those. Um, you can do things, but honestly, I just wish they gave you more factory options because I do think the standard like cars just look kind of boring. And um, that's just the nature of it. It extends the interior too. This interior is nice, but it's like, to me, it doesn't scream personality. And Tesla doesn't intend it to, right? They want it to be a minimal space. I get it. But that's not what every car buyer wants. So the nice thing is you do have options in this market. I think um, I would say like uh, Polestar, BMW, Audi, um, you know, they all do a better job, I think, of personifying their interiors, even in the volume space. Like, uh, I've missed the Kia Soul EV. One of the reasons is, aside from its funky shape, it had a really funky interior that was really cool and had personality. The Mini Cooper SE, also funky and has personality. Now, is it as good of an EV holistically and by the numbers? No, it's not. But uh, at least it shows you that like it's possible to make an EV and have fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. I think it's, it's totally an opinion, and this interior is fine. It's a minimalist. I think it looks clean. And some people like that, but I'm with you. I'd, I'd like something with a bit more personality, something just a bit more exciting. Yep. Our next kind of uh, niggle is the NACS adapter. So yes, I think as a connector, as a cable, NACS, the North American charging standard, the plug Tesla's use, it's great. You know, it provides DC and AC power and a really slim connection. The downside is everyone else doesn't use it uh, regardless of what tesla says and how open it is no one else has taken them up on that yet and we live in a world where there are like millions at this point probably of cables and connectors and public charge points and stalls that are j1772 which is that circular connector uh, that is part of the ccs type one the fast charging standard in the u.s it's what every other electric vehicle uses um that I'm aware of for sale, aside from like heavy duty things that may use proprietary ports. But basically, Tesla, because they have their own port, you've got to use an adapter to plug into those standard ones, right? That's right. I came from a Chevy Bolt, so all of my charging equipment at home was J1772, meaning 
every single time I plug in at home, I got to use this. Yeah. And this is just a little adapter. Uh, mm -hmm from uh, J1772 to Tesla. Yeah, and it's nice. They, th this came with the car. Came with nice. the car, which is nice. Yep. And it's not that big of a deal, but it is a little frustration, and I have to use that every single time I plug in at home, every single time I plug in at a public charger, level two. Yep. So Another thing beyond Tesla's control, like do, would I want Tesla to add a J1772 to their car and monk up the design? I don't know. I, if I were an engineer at Tesla, I can see why you would want that. But nonetheless, it's a real world issue that you face in every other car that you don't face in every other car that's not a Tesla. So, you know, it's two-sided. Yeah, of course, Tesla superchargers aren't really opened up yet in the U.S., um, so you can't use those. But so much other infrastructure is J1772. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say you can't use in the Tesla, it's just you've got to remember this plastic adapter everywhere yeah. you go. Additionally, one really small thing with that is when you're not using an actual Tesla connector, you have to manually open the charge port and it'll automatically close after a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this little race game that you have to open up the charge port, get the other charger out, plug in the adapter and plug it into your car all before the charging clap, uh, flap closes again. So yeah, it's, it's a bit annoying. annoyingly stressful for something that I imagine you do frequently because right, you had a bolt before, so you just have the J1772 receptacle in your house. It's pretty much every single time I plug in. Yeah, annoying. Other thing is build quality. And I know, I know, this has been played to death with Tesla. And we have seen improvements. Uh, our friend Colton, the Out of Spec Detailing Channel, has looked at Model 3s and Model Ys. And while, you know, I wouldn't say they're up to luxury car standards, should anyone expect that on an economy car? No. Absolutely not. They yeah. seem like they're a lot better, to be honest. More consistent, the paint's better, panel gaps, you know, they're getting better. I've got to be honest, they were pretty, like I saw a Model Y and a Model X in my uh, parking lot at a grocery store the other day, and they must have been a few years old, but like awful, awful door alignment. And that used to be very normal for Tesla. They have seemed to improve it, especially on their volume cars, the Model 3 and the Model Y, which are really their most important vehicles. I think where this becomes an issue is on Model S and X, like Kyle's Plaid, the price of the car and the performance of the car are amazing. but. Uh, the interior doesn't stack up and, and neither does the, just the general build quality. Definitely. I, I totally agree. I think they've made great strides with the 3 and Y and I don't think that you should expect much more for a forty fifty thousand dollar car. I think it's really solid. Mm -hmm. Once you start talking about 90, 100 plus thousand dollars, you're talking about a lot of really strong competition, really compelling packages. There's the Mercedes EQS, EQS SUV, BMW iX, there's just a ton of options and they all have really exceptional interiors and I, while the S and X is definitely a step up from what we see here in the 3 and in the Model Y, it's not quite up to par with those other vehicles. It's where you can tell Tesla's priorities really lie. Like the Model S, the new interior has that cool like rear screen for passengers they can watch YouTube on. It's got active noise cancellation. Like as a technology company, you know Tesla geeks out about all this stuff. But when it comes to like, oh, I want really nice feeling materials and like a super comfortable ride. Tesla doesn't really seem to be able or want to deliver in those areas. I don't think it's their top priority. No, it's not, and it shows. Um, but that just, you know, niggle on the more premium vehicles. To be honest, most people buying Teslas aren't buying those. Um, they're buying the Model 3 and the Model Y, and those have improved a lot. On the topic of Model Y in particular, though, um, I find that, like, from everything I've heard, and I know your uh, mom, I think, drives a Model Y. Yes. Um, the suspension in the Model Y, because it's a platform that's carried over for a Model 3, is really not that great. It's just like, I've heard complaints about it being stiff and uncomfortable, especially so in the performance model. Now, this changes. Some people say it's gotten better, but like I haven't heard many nice things in general about it. Yeah, certainly as far as older Model Ys go, those were significantly less comfortable than what I feel, feel here in the Model 3. Mm -hmm. I think they've made some improvements on the, on the Model Y. I'm not confident in saying that they're as comfortable as the 3. Yeah, I feel like though, in general, like, Mercedes EQE, okay, it's more expensive than a 3, but it's going to be a lot more comfortable. And Model Y, um, you know, we rode Mach-E recently, the Ford. Did you find that suspension kind of better or worse than Model Y? <laughs> we had the, the uh, Mach-E GT, so it right, had performance. a performance suspension. Yeah. I thought it was pretty comfortable, uh, comparable. Yeah. But neither of them were very comfortable. Neither of them pretty good. I found, personally, Kia EV6, uh, we drove the GT recently, but the normal EV6 and the Hyundai Ioniq 5 have really comfortable suspensions. I don't know if they're amazing from a performance standpoint, but they're fine. Like, they, they, they're they okay. They're average car suspensions, whereas 
everything I've heard of and the little experience in Model Y has been below average. It's just kind of an issue. And it's not just, oh, you know, my butt hurts a little more. It's like rear passengers. I, I personally know a family who got a Model Y and they sat their kid down in the seat uh, like newborn, you know, in, in one of those child carriers. And uh, one of the parents was sitting with them. They took one ride in that Model Y. This was like a year ago. And decided, no, this car's not going to work. It's just way too uncomfortable. Like, it's, we're not talking about a small issue. We're talking about like a big, just, I don't know. Like, I don't understand how this is not better. And I'm sure it will improve. But right now, it's kind of not super comfortable. Mm hmm. Uh, next thing is a uh, big one. It's Android Auto and CarPlay. So Tesla kind of stubbornly refuses to add this to their software, and there's arguments for and against it. You know, Tesla's own software is really good. Like I'd argue, basically the best in the industry. Their app is really great for connectivity. But nonetheless, I mean, wouldn't it be great to be able to use Waze or Apple Music or other apps from your phone in your car? Absolutely. This system is is really fantastic. One of the best in the business. Options are always better. I'd love to be able to use Google Maps when I'd like. I'd love to be able to have the flexibility that those offer. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just not a possibility. Yeah, I mean, if every, if any brand was to do it, I'd much rather it be like Tesla than GM to not do CarPlay in Android Auto. But I think it'd be so easy for them to do. I think it'd just be a bone to people. And I, I don't think it'd you know, take any value away from the cars. It's just, an e in my mind, an easy thing for them to do that they stubbornly just don't seem to want to do. Unfortunately, I don't think it's something they'll end up doing. No. Um, and that's unfortunate. Next one is, uh, you know, we're getting into more smaller niggles here, but... Yes, uh, there are plenty. There are so many. <laughs> but we're going to just touch on some of the big ones you noticed. So, no 360 camera on yeah. your car. Yeah, what the heck? My Chevy Bolt from 2017, which hit an even lower price point back then, uh, had a great 360 degree camera. Yeah. This has nothing. Also, as you mentioned, it doesn't have the ultrasonic sensors, so it's relying on Tesla cameras. Vision, which yeah. we've currently, again, we're making this video in, what is it, um, May of 2023, things change with Tesla all the time, but as of now, it's, it's bad. Pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much unusable. Yeah. Yeah, very, like, you just, I can't How trust do you park? It. Like, I can't trust it. I have to, you know, it's not the end of the world. I use my eyes, use my mirrors. Yeah. I've learned how to drive in other vehicles, so yeah. I'm not totally reliant on that. But it's frustrating. I, I would much rather have that, especially in such a high-tech vehicle like this. Additionally, like, like the turn signal stock, it's just not that great. And we have auto wipers for the vehicle, but they're bad. They're just not good. There's also auto high beams that turn on at night and are supposed to help you so you don't blind other drivers, but they're worse than useless. They just constantly flash people, leave them on when you don't want them to. It's awful. Yeah, uh, I, it, it confuses me because you think of Tesla as such a, a brilliant technology and software company, and yet when it comes to their algorithms for automatic lights or high beams and uh, automatic wiper speed, they just don't seem to have done anything to it in years. Yeah. One of the things with the auto wipers is they decided to use a camera to to de uh, detect the rain on the windshield. So mm -hmm. that's different from everyone else, and it doesn't work. Oh, so, does everyone else use wait, uh, wait, wait, well, some other kind uh, of sensor? Some other sensing, yeah. Okay. They use a, but not a vision system. Not vision. Yeah. I mean, Tesla's ambition in these areas are great, but sometimes their stubbornness leads to just like poor user experiences like that. Yeah. Um, and that's a reality. You might say, oh, we'll just wait for three years when the robo taxis are out it's going to be perfect well we're, we're in the here and now and it's not great right now yeah and along those lines i'm 25 years old my eyes are fine i was so excited to see the update that allowed for bigger text font on the screen it was so small before it's better now it still seems pretty small you know that's a super interesting one to me because it's like that shows you so much about tesla's priorities as a company they're so ambitious this is such a sophisticated screen you've got ryan like a playstation 5 in terms of internals in your car it's absurd like tesla way you know they get computers they do it really well nonetheless they also think like a computer nerd and not like a normal car user. And as a result, or a lot of their software engineers seem to. And while they overall do an amazing job, I absolutely agree with you. It's weird to me and downright unsafe how small these icons are. Like you and I can see them. We're you know young. We have okay vision. Like we can see them fine. But like 
it's not as big or comfortable as other cars, having the accessibility options great. So that's something we have improved on finally. It was overdue. But it, it, they tend to just have these blind spots like that. Yeah. Um, so that's why we make videos like this, because we want them to get better and improve. And so it, it's great when they actually do update and improve things. A lot of the benefit of a car like this, when everything goes through a screen, is that so much of it is updatable. Yeah. I, another thing I've really noticed with the Tesla is it's user interface is extremely driver centric and some of you may think hey that's a great thing i, I love that it's yeah. all about me the driver but it leads to some frustrating situations for example there's no way to turn off the passenger air so if you wanted no air on you you can point the vents away but that's it because there's a touchscreen system for controlling the air vents and that applies i think across tesla's entire lineup now. yeah yeah it's even worse for the rear seat they have no control at all whatsoever so do you want to see what happens if they want the seat heaters on. This is the only way to do it through the touchscreen. You gotta do this, click rear, and then you gotta know the trick and you press them so they turn on. <laughs> That's how you do it. There's there's no buttons back there. You could use voice control if you wanted, but it's, it's distracting the driver when it absolutely doesn't need to because every other car decided let's just put a button and let the passengers control it for themselves. It's really clunky. Yeah. They've they've got great UI, they've got great software, yeah. but they also have some blind spots. Yeah, worthwhile mentioning that. And I found your driver-centric note interesting because they, the latest Model S refresh, I think, makes the screen like swivel a bit so like it can motor-ish towards the passenger. So that's at least a physical accommodation they're making. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the software does, I think, improve in the sense of like I don't know if this is a good thing but like other car makers Porsche Mercedes and the luxury space in particular are really experimenting with passenger screens and providing more kind of uh, non-driver like just entertainment options in the car right yeah I don't like Tesla who's like proudly you know bragged about being able to play games in their car I don't understand why they don't let passengers do that while you're driving I mean, I think that'd be an easy win. Uh, you know, make sure drivers can't do it because we know there's plenty of stupid people out there who will do things like that. But yeah, Tesla what? isn't the best with driver monitoring, so. <laughs> we, as, as numerous evidence has shown, and you know, yes, the responsibility of idiots like that is on idiots like that. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But Tesla could improve systems like driver monitoring because we have seen bad behavior where some individuals who think their car can drive itself when everyone will tell you it's not quite ready yet will just be irresponsible. If you want to try full self-driving these cool features in a safe way and observe it, feel free to. You know, we, we know people who do that. They make videos about it. They're really impressed with the system. That's cool. Uh, now we're getting into kind of, you know, just more niggles about future software features they could add. We could talk about that all day, but I think, Ryan, that kind of covers a lot of the good, um, just, I don't know, the uh, low-hanging fruit with things I think Tesla could pretty easily improve or some of the biggest shortcomings they have that you can find alternatives to in the car market. Absolutely. I think it's important to be aware of those shortcomings. Tesla's a great brand. They've got a really compelling product, but there's a lot of flaws with it, as with every vehicle. So it's important to acknowledge them. Yep. And the cool thing with Tesla is so many of these, not, not all these, but a lot of these are honestly pretty, like, I could see them fixing or iterating upon it within a year or two uh, just because of their timeline. So we made a video talking about all the great things about Tesla if you do want to see that. If you're shopping in the market for a Tesla and you haven't seen that one, check out that one too. It's a great compliment to this. But Ryan, I think we've covered good ground here and I'm sure there's more that people will have to say so they can comment if they have their own quirks and niggles with various aspects of Tesla software or the user experience. I can't wait to hear everyone tell me why my car is awful. I think um, it's kind of like iPhones, right? Like an Apple. Like the conversation around it is generally like I use an iPhone, I use a MacBook, I love them. I'm not that doesn't stop me from criticizing what I don't like about Apple products. Similar thing with Tesla. They have raised the bar in so many areas. They really I think kind of just reinvented the car industry, but they are far from perfect in many areas. So hopefully this kind of helps highlight those. Absolutely. And I think the only way we can see this improve is by bringing attention to the problem spots. Yeah. So if you want to see this improve, please watch this video, share it with friends who you think it's relevant to. And thank you so much for watching Out of Spec Guide. We'll have more relevant EV buyers information for you in future videos. Thanks so much for watching.